Here we are talking about the human spirit. What exactly is the human spirit? And this is going to be a three-part series. The first part we're going to just talk in generalities about all human spirits. Um, then we're going to make a distinction between those who have the Holy Spirit and those who do not. In other words, those people who belong to God and those people who do not. And then the um, next video we're going to talk about those people who do not have the Holy Spirit and uh, characteristics of their particular human spirit. And then we're going to talk about those people who do have the Holy Spirit and, and thus have a new spirit which was prophesied um, by Ezekiel in chapter 36. And we can see from moving from old spirit to new spirit that there's a model of transformation that God has for us to renew our mind, which is the human spirit. And then I'm, I'm going to have sort of a, a, a reference video, as it were, related to these human spirit videos that's going to talk about, um, in generalities, what that model of transformation is. Uh, the book, Who is the Holy Spirit, is linked to in the description. And this content is part one of that book where we are kind of laying the, f the framework and the groundwork to be able to start answering the question, who is the Holy Spirit? So uh, here I'm going to be reading out of one of the footnotes. Um, it's going to be, again, the, the because it's sort of a final draft version, the pages are not 100% fixed. And so the, the, this footnote is going to be in the 600s as far as page is concerned, but I'm not going to give an exact page. The, the verse is Psalm 51, verses 10 through 12. It's in the inferred references to the Holy Spirit chapter. And so all of these verses are marked with a yellow dot because we mention a, a spirit, but not necessarily the Holy Spirit. Okay. So let me read... Um, let me read the, the verse. Uh, so Psalm 51, 10 through 12. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Which is obviously talking about the human spirit, right? Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. So then commenting on um, verse 10. I write, spirit within me refers to David's human spirit. Renew a right spirit. David is likely, likely speaking of the new human spirit promised at salvation. Um, that's going to be what we're going to talk about in the third um, video. So I'm not going to read that right now at this moment. Um, so the human spirit serves several functions. You can see this in sort of the beginning of the, the book where we're talking about the four rational spirits. Um, but here in this footnote, I kind of just give a list of four items of exactly what the human spirit accomplishes. Um, number one, it's the spark of life. Um, humans, if they did not have a spirit, they could not exist. Um, we see this in James chapter 2, verses 20, verse 26. For as the body without spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also body must have spirit. The reason why all of the processes work, the central nervous system, the, the brain, why all of it works is because there is a spirit which is regulating the processes and it is not just some, some cascade chain of events where everything just sort of ma somehow magically falls into place as um, Darwinian evolutionists would assume is what happens. Um, so life doesn't just happen randomly. It happens because God applies spirit and, and that spirit organizes cells in such a way, number one, that they function, and then number two, that they, they operate within the framework of all the rest of the body so that the thing actually works, okay? So spirit is a spark of life. Number two, it is the rational element giving reason to the human mind. The process of a new spirit begins when one receives the Holy Spirit of salvation, which we're going to talk about. 
then it continues to be renewed uh, by communing with God and setting itself on the things of the Holy Spirit. So a rational mind, I, I'm not going to rehash this because I talked about in a previous video, part one of the video, what is spirit? I talk about the part of the human spirit is the human mind and the human mind is in the human spirit as opposed to the human soul. Not the same thing, okay? So the reason why we're able to be rational is because... Um, we because we have this sense of reason imposed upon us based upon our spirit, and ultimately that that basis comes from God. And so, what's the um, pretty much universally agreed upon, except for some Eastern mystics or something, the universally agreed upon reason is the principle of non contradiction. And so like something can't be one thing and another thing in the same way at the same time. My finger can't be a toad and my finger in the same place at the same time, right? It, it, if, if I say it, it's my finger, but it's really a toad like that, like the human mind can't make sense of that. It can't understand that. It can't um, be able to predict reality, right? Because if, um, and, and so another, another, since we're talking about the law of identity, my finger is my finger is my finger is my finger, and it persists in being my finger. If it can just jump um, from being a finger to being a Kleenex to being a box of soap to being an airplane to being a bomb uh, to being a hyena, like if, if, if the finger is just wildly gyrating in and out of function and form, there's no way for us to be able to um, to use it and to understand it, right? And so it, ha it has to have uh, an identity which is um, fairly constant so that we can have the ability to be able to, to understand it, okay? Um, number three, it is the transcendent element which allows humanity to rise above merely physical processes and rightly apprehend them. Atheists have no such basis because they staunchly deny anything that is not physical. So, right, the soul and the spirit are immaterial. They are inscrutable by science because science, the, the, the domain that science and the scientific method claims is um, matter and energy. If there's something that falls outside of matter and energy, it, it doesn't even claim to be able to explain it. There are some people who would, who would be called... Um, they would fall under the category of scientism and they would say no, nothing exists that is not physical. And so therefore science can explain absolutely everything in all existence because the only things in existence are what science explains. Except that the Bible does not teach that. The Bible teaches that there are immaterial things, the mind, which is the human spirit, and also the human soul, these things are immaterial and therefore science, science cannot possibly make any possible claim. You can't put a soul inside of a test tube and uh, you know, ir irradiate it with gamma radiation or wh whatever, whatever your little test is that you're going to make up. Uh, atheists have no such basis because they staunchly deny anything that is not physical. They can only assume without any empirical proof that they are rightly perceiving the external world. Testing the thing you are using to test violates the scientific method. It is also the element that grants um, spoken language. Okay. Um, I want to read a quote um, from a, a letter that Charles Darwin wrote um, in 1880s. And this is from the autobiography of Charles Darwin in Selected Letters, um, printed originally in 1892 and reprinted in 1958. Um, in this, Darwin is talking about the human mind, a.k.a. the human spirit. And he says, the, the horrid doubt always arises with the conviction of a man's mind, which has developed from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust the conviction of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind, right? And so this is, this is Darwin's worldview that from pond slime emerged um, apes and from apes emerged humans, you know, via billions and billions of years in complex, complex, complex mutations over very, very long periods of time. That's how the theory goes, right? And so ultimately our mind derives, according to this theory, 
derives from the mind of a monkey. And he's saying, well, the, why, why should you have any basis to believe that a monkey has, has any uh, ability to understand anything that's true? Okay. The helpful uh, element that Christianity and the teaching of the Bible adds to us is that humans have a spirit, again, an immaterial part of our being, which is rational, which is not merely, I mean, some people have called humans in the human brain an organic machine. It's just atoms going boingy, 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 and somehow the boingy, boingy, boingy adds up to something. The mind and intuition and desires and feelings and dreams and hopes and despair and longings and um, self-awareness, rationality, all these things, some, somehow boingy, 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 adds up, adds up to that. It's fascinating, okay? But the thing is, is that the, the mind going boingy, 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 how, do, how can you prove that that is able to rightly apprehend reality? And even Charles Darwin himself, himself admitted that, that um, there's a horror doubt that how you can't know. You just have to assume. You just have to assume, oh, it's true because it's true because it's true because it's true. I can't prove it. There's no basis for proving it. I just have to blindly assume and we will never discuss it again. Like, well, okay, Christianity in our worldview actually gives us a basis because we have an immaterial part of our being, which is the spirit. And that spirit comes from God's breath and God existed outside space, time and matter and therefore transcends space, time and matter. And he created space, time and matter, which was not able to create itself. How, I mean, something that doesn't exist, how can it create itself? It, it, can't, it doesn't even exist. It can do nothing. Right? God created it from outside of it, and therefore he is above it. He is able to rightly perceive it and rightly understand it because our spirit comes from God. Right, And again, our spirit is above and in some sense outside of the physical processes of matter and energy. We can rightly perceive and apprehend it and know that we are, are coming to a right recognition of reality. Whereas atheists, they have no basis. They just have to assume, 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 assume. And then just when they get done assuming, they have to assume, assume, assume some more. Right, and so in the the study of um, philosophy is called epistemology, the the study of the knowledge of things. How how does uh, a person know anything, right? And so we have to make these. Sorry, my foot's falling asleep. We have to make these just a blind assumptions. And the beauty of the the Christian faith is we only have to make one assumption, and of course God is the one who gives us that faith, which is why we're willing to make it. Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith, right? No one can confess Jesus but by the Holy Spirit. And so, and the Holy Spirit is the spirit of faith. And so we're given this faith. We can just believe in God. And therefore, because we believe in God, all the other things fall into place, right? The reason why there's rational numbers, why does one plus one equal two? It, it comes together because God made it that way, not because it's just the most random thing anyone ever heard of and it's just somehow left to chance because somehow there's this immaterial thing, one plus one or one or two or three or whatever with these rational numbers or abstract numbers, excuse me, that just exist that, that are not physical, right? They're obviously plainly not physical things. So, um, the human spirit is very, very helpful for all people who, I mean, believers and unbelievers, even though the unbelievers deny it because they deny that they have a spirit, um, atheist unbelievers deny that they have a spirit. Um, it's very helpful because it means that we can actually rightly apprehend reality as it is. And then, number four, it is the element that connects us to God. That's why a new spirit, again, we're going to talk about that in a later video, uh, why a new spirit is so important when Adam and Eve rebelled against God, their spirit became alienated from God in a sense it was dead. Not that it no longer existed, but it was cut off from God. Thus, God promises a new spirit. Okay, so um, now I'm going to read another footnote, and this footnote is from Jude. It's going to be in the six, 600s. Uh, again, the ch the chapter is um, going to be explicit references to the Holy Spirit. And so all the verses in this chapter are marked with green because they all explicitly reference the Holy Spirit. And the verse Jude uh, chapter 1 verses 19 through 20. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit, 
but ye, beloved, building yourselves up on the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. And so I'm just going to read this as the, the basis for making a distinction between those who have the Holy Spirit and those who do not have the Holy Spirit as our evidence and criterion of salvation. And then we're going to make um, the next video talking about people who do not have the Holy Spirit and then the video after that talking about people who do um, to try and understand um, what's going on with the human spirit a little bit better. Uh, okay, here... Jude makes a distinction between those having not the spirit who are sensual, relying only on their senses, their physical senses, taste, touch, sight, hearing, and smell, right? The five senses. Because they do not have God's Holy Spirit and those who pray in the Holy Ghost, relying on God's Holy Spirit to enable them. What is the difference between people who have the Holy Spirit and those who do not? Number one. The world cannot receive the Holy Spirit because it is not looking for him. John 14, verses 16 through 17. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Two, only those with the Holy Spirit belong to God. And then there's a, a section in the, in the books, you can look it up in the, in the table of contents, he saves. In the 200s. Okay, Romans uh, chapter 8, verses 9 through 11. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, which is equivalent to the spirit of God, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, if, I-F-F, if and only if, it doesn't say that in the text, but I'm saying that. If the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by the spirit that dwelleth in you. Of course, the implication is if, if the spirit doesn't dwelleth in you, then it's not going to raise you from the dead and give you life because you don't have that spirit, right? Uh, number three, the distinctive of the sons of God is that they follow the leading of the spirit of God. Romans 8, 14 through 16. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Uh, number four, only those who have the Holy Spirit can understand the things of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 through 14. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for those who love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches, searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of, of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things we also speak in the words, which man's was, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Neither can we know him, because they are spiritually discerned. And so, so far we have a distinction. Um, Jude uses the word sensual. And Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uses the word the natural man. In other words, people who are utterly relying on their senses because, and that's the only thing they're relying on because they don't have the Holy Spirit. And the natural man, again, does not have the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the things that are from the Holy Spirit are foolishness to him because he doesn't have the Holy Spirit to be able to understand them. Okay. Number five, only those with the Holy Spirit can worship God. John chapter four, verses 21 through 24. Jesus saith unto her, woman, believe me. The hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship ye what ye worship ye know not what. We worship we know what we worship. 
for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. In order to worship God, you have to have God. If you don't have God, then you can't worship God. Even if you say, I worship God. I, I just insist that I worship God. I shout from the rooftops, I worship God. Well, if you don't have the spirit of God, then you can't worship God. It's not possible. Even if you shout from the rooftops and you um, throw a ticker tape parade and you march up and down the streets with signs for 20 years in a row, that doesn't mean that you worship God. You have to have the spirit of God to worship God. And if you don't have the spirit of God, then you cannot do it. Period. Okay. Probably not a popular teaching. Number six, only those with the Holy Spirit can pray how God desires. And so the sacrifices that God desires, communion and relationship with him, it depends upon the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, then you're dead in the water. It's kind of like if, you, you know, if you're stranded on a desert island and you have a phone, you can call for help. If you're on the desert island and you don't have a phone, you're dead in the water. You ain't going nowhere. You ain't calling nobody. You're not going to have any fellowship with anybody because nobody even knows you're there. Maybe it's not the greatest example, but it's something, you know. So Ephesians 6.18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And of course, the verse that we just read out of June, Jude, excuse me. Uh, but ye, so Jude is making a contrast between those who separate themselves sensual, having not the spirit. But ye, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. You're praying in the Holy Ghost because you have the Holy Ghost to pray in. Okay, so the next video we're going to talk about um, the unsaved, people who do not have the Holy Spirit and are not sealed by the Holy Spirit. They have the old spirit. And we're going to talk about what that means. And then the video after that, part three, we're going to talk about what it means to have a new spirit and also to have the Holy Spirit.